Welcome to the Human Frequency on American Freedom Radio. We're coming to you live from the mountains of Southern Kern County in beautiful California. And we are just days away from an event we're doing in the Bay Area. So we're very excited getting ready to come up to San Rafael and talk about Organite and Orgone Energy, which is something we've been exploring a lot in Southern California. And now we're very happy to bring this life-giving energy to Northern California. So everyone up there can do what we've done here, improve the weather, the climate, bring back rain, clean the air, and neutralize electromagnetic fields in your home. So this is just great for us and it's gonna be great for everyone. So excited to be bringing this knowledge and we hope to see a lot of you out there in San Rafael. We're gonna be at the TMS Performing Arts Center and finally get a chance to meet you guys. And uh, anyway, you can check out more about this on our website, thekembo.com. And today, we actually are here with a special guest, which is our producer of our event up there in San Rafael, Lloyd Bard. And Gabriel is going to introduce him. Yes, I'm very excited too. Lloyd Bard has an instinctive gift for providing music for creative movement and healing. With nearly 50 years in the heart of the music business, Lloyd has been a music guru for thousands of teachers, innovators, dance facilitators, and music aficionados. Currently, he is producing a series of concerts in Marin County, California, with conscious world music artists, singer-songwriters, chart acta, excuse me, chart artists, and leaders of the new musical vanguard. He also leads groups solo or with his wife, Deborah Wilder, for men and women on gender issues and disarmament, and has a deep understanding of inner freedom. Lloyd, thank you for joining us today, and welcome to the Human Frequency. Thank you very much, Gabe and Sharon. It's a pleasure. Well, thank you, Lloyd. And uh, it's been really cool setting up this event with you up north. And uh, you do a lot of amazing events up there. It's it's amazing you get all these musicians together that are actually doing something meaningful and conscious, which is kind of a rarity nowadays. Yes, wonder- it is. And the quality of the artistry and the music, you know, is even beyond the, the doing good in the world. But they're completely unified and linked it's it's interesting because there seems to be this universal consciousness in music and i think what you're doing is just completely outside of the mainstream in the mainstream nowadays in music is just you know it's it's a, de- a jo- it's a joke it's a degradation of music so it's it's great that there's people out there like you who are bringing real music to the public and yeah. actually we we met through music and that's what's interesting is how... That's how... right. I, sh- I should have uh, prefaced that. But uh, for our listeners, Lloyd and I met via my exploration on Discogs.com. I was looking for uh, looking for albums by my favorite ambient artist, which is Steve Roach. And I just happened to... I happened to want, at that time, an album. I honestly don't even recall what it was. But I knew that... By searching on Amazon, which is why where I usually buy things like this, I didn't see it. So uh, I had to look look to other avenues where they, where this might be sold. So I went on Discogs and formed an account, and and I found it. And <laughs> and Lloyd, I found you there, and we started talking about about a, mostly about musical stuff. And I found the album that I wanted, and many others soon thereafter. And uh, the discussion eventually led to smart meters, amongst other things, and <laughs> then then it led to our topics, and it was just kind of a very large harmonic convergence of sorts right. that led us to where we are now. Yeah, Steve Roach is my favorite artist too, by the way, and uh, and recent favorite that I discovered in the weirdest way through Grand Theft Auto, uh, the <laughs> video game. I don't play, <laughs> yeah, I don't play video games these days. That's a few years back, but there was an ambient music station that I kept playing on the sh- on that game because you could pick your station on the radio. Once you steal the car, you once can you pick steal the, the car, you can pick the station. That's and, nice. <laughs> and I was just transfixed by Steve Roach, and it was an early one, the song "Arrival," which was one of his '80s tracks, and. Actually, I, the, my first question for you is, how did you become acquainted with these great ambient artists back in the 80s? Well, let's see. Um, music has always been a great love of my life. Um, even before that, when I first saw the movie Fantasia, I was like five years old. 
and I discovered how much music is a visual experience for me. I kind of see it. It's an interesting thing. Um, and sometime, a little bit during high school, I went to a high school in Seattle that was pretty much all Motown, which was great. And sometime after that, I started buying records. Um, LPs, those things that are very heavy and very large. And I <laughs> developed quite a habit of buying records every day after class on my way home, spending more time with my turntable than actually in class. And even at that point, I had the desire to get to know some of the artists that I was really enjoying. So I was always willing to meet people, to write to them, to uh, try and develop friendship, which has always been the great passion in this life for me. And I started record stores moving from Seattle to Greeley, Colorado, uh, when I was just not even 22. And we created these amazing record stores and artists would come by and they do in-store plays and I started to meet more and more of them. And then it took a turn as my own life started opening to Sufi dancing and meditation and all kinds of movement activities and uh, letting my mind and the rest of me expand. And the whole kind of new age, ambient world music sphere started to explode and at that time having done some music tours uh, early early preceding my now you know producing music concerts and I met some very good artists and traveled and did a tour with a great singer named Kate Wolf and then I met Will Ackerman who was the founder of the great Wyndham Hill record company and after this successful tour that I did, I felt like I was obviously a hotshot producer. So I told him, I said, Will, I want to produce your artists. I can do that really well now. And he said, oh, no, 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 I don't need any of that. Go back to Colorado and sell these record albums for me. I just released this guy. He's going to do pretty well, and his name's George Winston. So that was a doorway. And soon after that, I was driving from record stores to small clubs in Colorado with Will Ackerman and George Winston. So we became lifelong friends uh, to this day. And so that started a pattern and a trend where if I heard about an artist, I would get in touch with them. So in the growth of particularly new age music, the people that became the icons, uh, all the overnight sensations, you know, it took them at least 10 or 15 years to achieve that. But people like Lorena McKennett and Yanni and Ray Lynch and the aforementioned Steve Roach, I was kind of there helping them, developing my business, which was called Backroads Music. And so I go to Ray Lynch's porch and pick up cassette tapes. We've now evolved from record albums. And I talked to Steve Roach and we'd hang out and he was like this biker dude back in those days. And I talked to Lorena McKennett in Canada and this was before she signed with Warner Brothers and before she became one of the major artists in any kind of music in the world. So that was how I developed this um, desire and ability to befriend the artists. And definitely more than just the business sense, although that was important. Um, if I was late paying Lorena McKennett, she would let me know about it <laughs> in no uncertain terms. So that was a great relationship. Now when she comes, you know, we're happy to see each other. I spend a few minutes backstage and introduce my wife, Deborah, to her. And so, you know, it's brilliant. And so producing the concerts, which has been a natural evolution, one of my norms or recipes for doing concerts is I only work with friends. So I must have a lot of amazing friends. I do. And this means sit around the table, spend the night kind of friends, not just I sold a lot of records and I've known them for a long time. This is like abiding friendships. Mm -hmm. And so it's a whole different thing. It becomes very cooperative. We're not on opposite sides of the table. And the other thing I've done from a few years of concert experience, there's always this thing, this model 
where the artists need to be paid a minimum or a guarantee so that if the whole thing falls through, at least they get this or that. And as I started to do this independently, I'm not a big company and I'm still kind of a random rookie producer, at least in my own mind, um, I also would say to the artists, even you know, major artists in this realm, Deva Primal or Sonatum Carr, who are like the, the champions of the champ world. And I'd say, you know how in life there's no guarantee? Well, so far, nobody has disagreed with that statement. And then I would say, well, when you work with me, there's no guarantee. We're in it together. And a couple of them had never done that before. And they decided to take a leap of faith and Bottom line, they ended up making more money than their minimum by far. Mm -hmm. And so now that I, it doesn't matter who they are or how great they are or how deeply we know and love each other, that's something that I won't, you know, adjust. It's so, such an organic. It's a great model. It's so organic. It's, again, it's completely, I, I don't mean to make comparisons, it's completely the opposite of the way that the mainstream music industry works, which is completely unnatural and has it's not even about music it's all just about business and there isn't any real relationship between the artists and, and the record companies but what you have going on for all these years is so organic and as a musician myself I wish back when I was still playing live that I had known somebody like you that would help it's so hard for people who are really earnest in their music and really artistic to find that kind of support and uh, I I'm just wondering also have you noticed a big change in music in the time you've been doing this? Or are you finding the artists that you're acquainted with are still very true to the original ideals? Well, I think that's part of creating and finding that connection. Um, the music business has changed dramatically. Sometimes I like to think I've never been in the music business because I've always been on the outside in my own way, just making things up, doing it my way. And the business aspect of it has never been central to what I was doing. Um, the record stores started from a 240 square foot little hole in the wall with eight orange crates of used records. And in fact, that store initially was called the finest used record store. We set a very high standard. <laughs> and soon, soon when the new Rolling Stones album came out, we couldn't wait for a used copy. So we decided, oh, what the heck, let's sell new albums, too. So we had to climb up on the ladder and cross the used off of our, <laughs> so, off of our store sign. What year was now this, Now we were the finest the record store. 1972 was when it started. It's so amazing. So I was right in the heart of it. And, um, and then we gradually grew, and a couple years later, we opened a second store in Fort Collins, which is also a college town in northern Colorado, and that one was really an overnight success. And Greeley continued to grow. And we sold uh, sleeping bags and turquoise jewelry. And then we got a T-shirt machine so we could make T-shirts. And we sold the highest quality stereos that we knew. And it was all very incongruent. But here's this, you know, basically hippie record store that everybody in town shopped at. We put all the other stores out of business. Um, cause we were doing it in a different way and we'd have a, a worldwide auction with rare albums, like the kind that you bought Gabe yep. that got us connected. Mm -hmm. And we did some really cool things. We'd have a one day a year wild sale where everything was on sale. And if I remember correctly, the first year we did that, um, all record albums were like $3 and 93 cents. So that was quite a different era. And we would do. $10,000 in one store and $5,000 in another store and then collapse. <laughs> yeah. and it was, it was the, the most fun. It was such a great time. And at a certain point, I felt to move on. And my cousin and partner, Glenn, you know, first he thought he was going to move on. And I said, well, then let's just sell the whole thing. He said, well, I don't know if you're going to go, maybe I'll stay. So, <laughs> which also worked out good. He did it for... Uh, 26 more years yeah. after that. So blessings for that. And I ran off and joined my own proverbial circuses, um, working with Gabrielle Roth, the great Tai Chi teacher, Al Wong, and doing workshops and 
going all around the country. I considered it, this was right before I turned 30, that I wanted to try out early retirement. So I, I wanted to retire by retired. 35, too. I had a goal. <laughs> yeah. What a Very great high aspiration. aspirations. So I figured e- even if it doesn't last that long, I'll have gained experience for when I retire later and I'll be better at it. Yeah. That was the way I thought. Well, you know. So I had a couple of years and ran off with my favorite singer who I was deeply in love with and made a tour. And that led to Backroads Music which also started in my laundry room. And then it grew and I only worked with friends. How interesting, I never thought of that. Until it got so big that we went to 26 employees and a really wild, raging machine in the heart of the uh, expanding as broad as I could consider new age music to be, which was, you know, not like you think of new age music in a record bin. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I feel that Obviously, with Steve Roach, the only practical medium is is on CD. But Sharon and I also do have a pretty yeah. considerable stash of records upstairs. I, I just have to share with you that when I was in junior high and high school, I started buying records. And this was during the time when there really weren't records. They'd take them off the shelves and replace them with CDs. And the CDs were in long boxes because they still had the record bins. Yeah. And... Huh. Everybody right. thought I was nuts for buying records. I was the only one doing it. Well, who's and, nuts now? Yeah. But <laughs> what's funny is my 1992 was like 1972. I even went as far as to change the years on my folder for my high school, Hamilton High School. It said the year 1990 to 91. I changed it to 70 to 71 because that's what I really <laughs> wished it was. So I was right buying on. those records back then. And uh, so I understand that that whole uh that whole thing about going after school to buy records because when I was buying them, you could get rare records for a buck. Like I got a mono version of Rolling Stones between the buttons for like a dollar ninety nine or something. Any uh, right. Grand Funk Railroad? Yeah. No, I never bought any Grand Funk Railroad. <laughs> I bought Beatles and Stones. I became an absolutely obsessed Pink Floyd fan. Pink Floyd was my well, very favorite band uh, at that time. But I, I think that many people who listen to prog rock and We'll move on mm-hmm. to uh, ambient music. Like me. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what's happened. We listen to Steve Roach every day. And that's it seems to be that Steve Roach takes up most of our airtime here in the studio. Back in 2008, I was listening to Yes and Emerson, Lake and Palmer and Gentle Giant, stuff like that. That was my everyday music. And now, now I, I just, you know, I've taken it down a notch. Steve Roach, Robert Rich. <laughs> yep. It's, yeah. Well, the, it's real conscious music, and when you're in a space of a meditative lifestyle, or in a, the case of what Gabe and I do as planetary healing work, you really don't listen to as much rock anymore at that point. It has its place. There's a time and a place for it, but we find that more often than not, you know, especially when we wake up and we just like some music for our breakfast and morning routine, and it's like, let's put on some Steve Roach. Yeah. And, and it just, and by now I have, I don't know, something like 15 or 20 albums of this. So know, there's, there's a lot to choose from. And I, I'm still at, like, I'm at the point now where I look at that selection of 15 to 20 albums and I'm like, oh, what, what, what haven't I listened to in a while? No, I just listened to that and that and that. It's, it's like, now I have to get an, another album. So I'll, uh, yeah. I, I, I certainly know where to go for that. Isn't that the great thing about music is, I mean, the pop music, it has a bell curve that goes very up and very down, and then it disappears. But this kind of music, I don't, you know, whatever we call it, conscious, spiritual, expansive music, it never gets old. Some of the stuff from the very first days of Backroads are still seminal favorites. Steve Roach, certainly, and John Sari, and David Parsons, and, you know, Michael Stearns, and they're always going to be the classics. And Steve Roach, just as a great example, since he's central to our meeting and this conversation, he's got so many albums in so many different realms and styles. Some are actually upbeat, and they are derived from the Tangerine Dream style. And others are 72-minute, one-track drones. Mm -hmm. But if you really listen, 
There's nothing boring about it. Right. It's it's this deep, deep journey. You have to learn to listen to music like that. It's not something that you can just turn on for a, a teenager who's been listening to Miley Cyrus. <laughs> it's going to confuse them. Yeah. Or 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 That's an alleged right. adult also listening to Miley, <laughs> Miley Cyrus. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's something, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, well, I have a well, I have a good friend who who has said to me, you know, life's too short to spend drinking crappy beer. But I'm going to take that a step further and say life is too short to spend listening to crappy absolutely. music. Absolutely. Music is part of our consciousness. It's a creative expression. And uh, you know, something I noticed about Steve Roach is that he captures times and places in his music and it has this universal consciousness to it. Like his earlier music that was written and recorded in Los Angeles, I've been listening to some of that early music and it literally reminds me of Los Angeles in 1983, which is when he did it. But I, I'm taken back to Los Angeles in 1983, which was the year I moved there as, as a child. And I'm, I'm there again. And some of his music takes me into the desert in Arizona where he lives. And some of it takes me out into outer space. And, uh, I've just noticed that he can elicit those kinds of feelings. Do you see that there's an overriding message in his music? Well, it, it's, I think it's more time and place, or could we say time and space? Mm -hmm. And he's very influenced by his environment. You know, it was a L.A. kind of thing for him. And I think it was like 88 or something like that, where he went to Australia and he spent a lot of time with the Aboriginal tribes and deeply became understanding of the Dreamtime experience. And he created an album called Dreamtime Return that was a turning point for this whole genre in its broadest sense. And after that, he was a really different person. And since I knew him before that, it was very easy to see and everyone could see it. And Steve was happy to talk about it and share and and represent that deeper earth connection that is the same energy as space, which is very interesting. Yeah. You can't really have one without the other. Yeah, I, I can definitely hear that listening to some of his stuff from from that that general area of like 80, 88 to 93 yeah. or so. I can definitely hear that Aboriginal influence to it. It's It's very pervasive in in his music at that time it's so earthy and like you said at the same time spacey it's it's yeah. so uh grounded in in indigenous culture and it's so grounded in yeah. our earth and at the same time i'm transported to the cosmos listening to this music very little music That's can right. do that and for you know, me not not too many of these artists in this style of music you know they don't play live often um, or when they do sometimes they're just replicating their recordings but if you've ever seen Steve live and you'll have a chance to it's a serious live concert he'll use his didgeridoo use these whirly things that it's like stirring up space dust and he's got <laughs> stacks of synthesizers but it's not like push the button and get the sound he's really creating a live and it's like he's the mad scientist he's got four hands and arms going in different directions and he's really um physical in his live concerts and robert rich from a different angle he's a little more scientific but the music is just as full bodied yeah and you know there's a few others that play live and some you know i saw tangerine dream once it was one of the most oh, boring wow. concerts <laughs> you know it was like there was nobody on stage, although there were three people. And the only time you could tell it was music was when the guy did a kind of a like guitar solo. That's that's yeah. very interesting but otherwise, because I, I have a so friend dark. is actually the same friend who oh. had, had the quote about the, the bad beer, but he, he went to one of one of the last Tangerine Dream con uh, concerts before uh before Edgar Froze died. But he said the same thing. It was just awful, and like they, the the ensemble was just just so off. Like like there was a guy with a soprano sax on stage. You just like who didn't know what the hell he was doing. It was just it was a mess. Aww, that's <laughs> <Yeah>. too bad. <laughs> and a lot of groups owe them 
for the initial inspiration and what they created. And, you know, I don't want to take anything away from them, but yeah. there's not much stage presence. There's no personal connection. It's well, like they... a lot of electronic music that just it, you know, if it's dance music, which I'm very much involved in, in my own version of it, but heavy beats and steady beats and they push the people to dance. Whereas really well carved music, some of Steve's upbeat stuff and all these chill out artists, they draw the dance out of you. They don't mm -hmm. make you obey their beats. And I watch this carefully because I DJ on a regular basis. And I love doing that. That's a chance for me to read the room. I never show up with a set list. I'm playing a track ready for the next track and I hear something in my head that wants to be played. And it's my job to figure it out and do a little switcheroo and change it because I can't walk in with a playlist. If I have a set list, I don't need to be there. Ah, so That's it's more intuitive. Put on the mix. It's completely intuitive. Yeah. And more fun. And I love the textural parts. And, you know, I, I love rock and roll. I think reggae music is my first love because it's total roots. And so having been seen as the Mr. New Age guy, or being referred to as the world's leading authority on new age music. And I just say, well, it's not my fault. But, um, you know, I love all kinds of music except opera. <laughs> <There's something laughs> That's about interesting. It. I, I just can't. And every now and then I thought maybe I'll go try it. And I go, well, there's a lot of things I haven't done that I really don't want to try. <laughs> and also, so I don't funny. have to and you can't make me. <laughs> Opera was always my least favorite category on Jeopardy. So maybe there's like a, a, a similarity thing <laughs> yeah. going there. <gasps> yeah. That's funny. That is pretty funny. I mean, I think musicals are way worse than opera. Oh, by uh, far. But, you know, I, I, I get what you're saying. It's not such an intuitive musical form. It's controlled screaming yeah. is what it is. Uh, maybe it's what ballet yeah, is to musicals. dance. Ballet is so controlled, too. It's it's this yeah. classical art form, but it's it's a little... Uh, stiff. stiff. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And, you know, ballet dancers, they have a very short shelf life. I guess that's not the way to say it. But their bodies <laughs> are battered and damaged at such early uh, ages. And I think feet. there's something about it. I wonder if opera singers are suffering in their vocal cords oh. in the same way. You can bet they are. Vocal nodules and <laughs> and uh, all kinds of problems. <laughs> I mean, I had a, a vocal cyst removed, and I, I all... I'm not sure what caused it. I have some ideas, but I used to be in a rock band and we sure screamed a lot. So, you know, that might have contributed. Maybe if you wore one of those <laughs> bullet helmets with the horns coming out yeah. and carried a big staff. Yeah. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, uh, what do you think? I mean, what's the most, I'm trying to think of how to say this. What is the importance of music for human consciousness? Oh, let me give it a moment's thought. Um, Deborah and I were just talking this morning how music is the weaving of the thread between connection. You know, you remember what the, what was happening, who you were with, or who just broke up with you, or who you decided this is the one, and you remember the song that was playing at that time, and you remember it for your whole life. And, you know, I'm so intentional in the music that I play. Um, I have like 14,000 CDs in my garage. And I am intimately knowledgeable about each one. It's not like, I want a big CD collection. I don't care what it is. It's like every single one of them has a moment in history. And so when I wake up, I pick out the song of the day. I hear it in my head. I go find it. Deborah and I have a little dance or a moment in the living room and all day long and there is times when it's quiet and her nervous system doesn't take quite as many beats as mine comfortably does and especially going on a road trip that's like the biggest thing i don't care about clothes it's like what cds am i going to take and and she likes to joke the car doesn't start until there's music in the cd player <laughs> well and it's pretty true it's that important yeah. And it's not an escape, and it's not a crutch. It's it's the uh, soundtrack. It's the orchestration right. of yeah. my experience. That's right. I've always said that music is the soundtrack of our lives. And there's music for places. There's music you play in the desert. 
there's music you play on the coast and I'll make a mix CD of like I have my PCH mix, you know, it's just places have their music. Mm-hmm. There's music yeah. you play while you're sawing bone. And I think that's what that, that butcher guy was. was uh, playing. We went to this, there was this one market we <laughs> shopped at back in LA. It was a little place where we went to get produce. And there was a period of time where the music was just unbearable. It was this electronic music with those like, kind of those backward beats that go, you know, that kind of stuff that was going on a couple years ago. And um, I heard it was the butcher's choice and a very apt choice it was. And you made, you made a great comment, Sharon, about that. (laughs) On my Yelp review. I put it on my Yelp review. You know, I'm a great Yelper. Just look for Sharon. (laughs) Look for Hecubus on Yelp and you'll, you'll find me. Um, But yeah, that, that music was definitely for sawing meat too. But then there's, you know, there's music to chill out to. There's music to make out to, right? Yeah, there's... music to go to sleep to. Mm-hmm. That's very important. If it and... works, if there's a few good things, then you know that you'll never hear the end of them. And in the case of Robert Rich, there's music to play that is specifically for when uh, you are asleep. Yeah, have you have you experienced That's somnium right. while sleeping? I have. I've done a live a live evening with him for about seven hours. So he performed it live while people slept. Yeah. So for for people who don't know about this, I I think you should describe the Somnium experience. And then, Sharon, you need to talk about your experience. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, like I said, Robert's a a deep-hearted scientist. He uses all different instruments. He doesn't consider himself a New Age or space music or ambient artist. You know, he has other reference points. He uses found sounds. He's, he's brilliant with his different synthesizers and electronic keyboards. But he had this idea to create an experience where people could, I guess it's similar, where people could sleep and dream together and commune in silence. And so people brought blankets and pillows and, you know, some people were upside down and sideways and some were off in the corner and others were in the cuddle puddle. And so <laughs> it's amazing. And, you know, he did, He does have a CD that I think it was one of the first things that was sold digitally because it was too long to put on, like, that many CDs. It's yeah. actually a DVD because there's so much data on there. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's what it is. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. My experience with Somnium, we tried listening. To, I'd like to try it again. We listened to it one night while we slept, and I just kept waking up in the middle of the night hearing these little blips and blurps, and I really felt like I was on acid. I felt like I had fallen asleep <laughs> during an acid trip and was waking up and was still not, I still hadn't come down yet. <laughs> it was yeah. a little peculiar. Maybe that's why he did it, because, you know, those last few hours are the ones where you're going, is this ever going to end? Where's the <laughs> Paul Horn inside the Taj Mahal album or something it's... that you really needed to be able to come down? <laughs> yeah, it's it's really interesting. And th- this music that, that we met over, it's the music of consciousness. And that's what attracts me to it, is it really is working with the brain states and it's it's working with your, your heart. And uh, yes, I wonder if you could... Well, because mainstream music nowadays is nowhere near music, I know that there's another world of music, and it's not just these artists that have been around since the 80s, but there are people coming out now with with great music too, because you know about them, and you're sharing this through your concert series. What's new in music today? Um, Well, first I want to say about conscious music, there is not conscious music there are conscious artists and there's a distinction because an artist like india re who i kind of think of as the the female version of stevie wonder and how could stevie wonder not be one of the most conscious artists ever and it's still pop music or r b and i was listening to india re the other day remembering this concert going she is the purest icon of of connection and love and reality. She sings about relationships like nobody does. And yet it's totally pop and produced and like it's the highest quality music. So it's really, it's the artist. Mm. I am sure somewhere there's a death metal artist who's totally conscious in his own realm. And it's his expression. I mean, people considered Kurt Cobain 
to be a really conscious artist or he never would have broken through to that much popularity or that much torment or however you interpret it. Yeah. So, you know, there's people in the new age music world. There's a, a artist that's very famous, one of the pioneers. And I used to always say, boy, he needs his music more than anyone does. Cause he was like a really skitsy guy. So without naming names, but um, it's really, it's the person. Yeah. And if they're in their passion and their purpose and they become a, they develop a degree of fluidity and fluency in how they're expressing it and they're willing to change and grow. So that was the great prelude to your question answer. Um, the artists I work with are mostly singers, songwriters, artists that work in the chant realm where they're chanting ancient mantras from different cultures. Um, there's usually at least some direct spiritual connection. And this whole practice of singing together, call and response, is called kirtan or kirtan. But it's not a genre of music because any musician can bring their style to call and response. You know, and some of my friends, I produce like seven years of chant concerts in a sweet place in Berkeley. And my friends would say, I don't like that kirtan music. I don't like call and response. And I go, well... Did you ever go to see the young bloods when they were singing, come on people now, smile on your brother, everybody get together, and the whole crowd was singing? I said, that's call and response. I said, did you ever see you 2 where he's singing, I still haven't found what I'm looking for, and then the whole band stops and oh, 50,000 yeah. people are singing? It's intense. Yeah. That's conscious, spiritual call and response music. And Bruce Springsteen, if that's not a religious experience, I don't know what is. And these are some of the most popular musics. And people like Sting, from what I understand, it's never really been my cup of tea. I like the police. Sting's a little highbrow for me. But that's just from a lack of experience. But what he's doing now with He's a little music, thinky. <laughs> yeah, but he's so, he's so uh, involved in human rights and doing good on the planet. And he realizes he has a voice and a vehicle. So he's he's doing good. Right. He's really doing good. And and the, the new vanguard of music, in my mind, is very rootsy. It's in the earth. It has to do with being aware of sustainability. Um, there's an artist named Trevor Hall, who's very rootsy. He's kind of the second coming of Michael Franti who would certainly be considered a conscious artist, although he wasn't always by outside appearances. But now Michael Franti's like the man. And Trevor, he's singing songs about receive, receive. You know, you can't hurry your healing. And this guy's the man at festivals. And we went to see him recently in Mill Valley. And what Deborah noticed was this young audience Everybody in the place was singing along with his lyrics. They all have his songs memorized, which was a great sign. And now there's people, names like uh, Nako and the Medicine People and Xavier Rudd and this woman named Ayla Nario who lives up in Grass Valley. I am so excited to produce her concert because I met her once. She blew me away and I said, I want Ayla. And just from our meeting, I felt like she has uh, qualified for the real friend category because it doesn't take long. Sometimes it takes forever and you never get there. So there's just artists like this where the words matter, the music's clever. Um, this man named Elijah Ray that I was fortunate to produce this summer, he's Elijah Ray and the Band of Light. And the Band of Light is the audience. And wherever he goes around the world to the Wanderlust festivals, he goes to Bali, Ibiza, Goa, Byron Bay in Australia. I go, where are you living these days? He goes, wherever I am. And he's this beautiful, bright, light person with so much musical skill. And he does looping where he'll lay down the guitar part and then he'll push the pedal and it keeps going. And then he'll do the 
and they lay down this bottom that is so funky and deep. And he gets it all going and you close your eyes and you open them and it's not like he's standing on stage, you know, leaning on a, a guitar, but he's got five choral parts going and he, he did Peter Gabriel's Don't Give Up, that beautiful song, like better than Peter Gabriel. He did. Mm -hmm. He said, now we're going to call in Archangel Michael because it is a religious experience, he says, and that would be Archangel Michael Jackson. And oh. he does want to be starting something, all the parts, including the high whoops and screams. It was better than Michael Jackson. <laughs> Everybody in the whole place was completely blown away. Mm. So that's that's what the conscious music is. It's in all forms. And the thing about Elijah, he does these sound light healing things. I'll have to figure out how to hook you up with this, which won't be hard, by the way, um, where he'll do a two hour thing with voice, almost Gregorian and whale sounds that he's generating with his voice. And he has this special pedal where if he steps on it, it lowers his voice an octave. So he's singing with himself multiple octaves. And it's a journey, you know, where people just lay down, they close their eyes, they open their eyes and go, what is going on there? Who is this guy and where am I? An artist and it's incredible. An artist has to be completely unselfconscious to do that kind of music too, because uh, I think a lot of musicians are very ego conscious or thinking about image. And if you're doing stuff like where you're literally changing the pitch of your voice and using your voice as an instrument, you've got to be really yeah. open to to be able to do that because it's not even you anymore. That's that's the channeling. That's and, exactly right. He's, yeah. he's the channel. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine who's another great singer who is really on the rise, her name is A.D. Bell. She was at a different evening with Elijah Ray. And I said, so what did you think about Elijah? And she just looked at me and said, man, what a set of pipes on that guy, you know, which was her way of honoring him because his voice, his guitar playing, his rhythm, his ability to ride the wave and conduct the songs, and every song he gets the audience singing, you know, like, for example, I'm ready to live my dream. I'm ready to live my dream. And people aren't just singing it. I'm telling you, you can see it. They're ready to live their dream. And they weren't before that song. So this is this is where it, where it reaches the highest heights. So how does a listener train themselves? Because there are many of us like you and Gabe and myself that we already know we already know what a conscious artist is and we can it's like we nobody needs to tell us that this music is universal and that this music is channeled but there are so many people who just don't understand it and so they're just going to take the surface you know the surface explanation like this is conscious new age music or this is really yes. hip and cool music but they're they're not, there isn't necessarily a, a real sentiment in the music. How do people train to, to understand what we intuitively already know? Yeah, I love that question. Um, suppose someone's been raised on eating McDonald's and Wonder Bread. You know, the, you wonder why they call it bread. And they have a <laughs> terrible diet that's, that's ruining their health and they don't know the difference. So when you're raised on mainstream pop music which has a lot of good in it and if it's a song that turns you on and turns you inside out that's a good song i don't care who it is mm -hmm. um but it how do how do you make that shift from realizing you know it's not just you are what you eat it's like it's one and the same it's what you put in your body and you know you can get good food and organic food and learn about it and people can learn to cook for themselves and I don't know where the shift happens, but the more of us that are doing it, the more other people are going to catch on, whether it's at a barbecue or a potluck, going, wow, what's that? That looks weird. Or with music, it's like, I don't like that. I don't like new age music. You know, it's my same thing. I don't like that chanting thing. And it's an idea. And part of it is a resistance to any change. You know, all change requires a certain letting go and opening with curiosity to what's about to happen, going, wow, I wonder what it would be like to 
listen to these artists I've never heard of because people say they're really good. I'll take the leap. That's how it happens. Yeah, you have but, to be you know, brave. You can play things for someone. Or if people are fairly set or closed, relatively, I could play them Elijah Ray, although I have to say, I got so many people coming to that concert by saying, go to YouTube, look up Elijah Ray. He's got lots of videos, 40 or 50 of them, and watch the one called Walk With Me. And people were flipping out and watching it over and over and over. And they came to the concert, and he way exceeded their overly high expectations. But he's unusual. I, I, don't, I don't really know of an artist like him. Another one is Donna DeLore, who's pretty well known. Um, her claim to fame, um, and she lives in Topanga Canyon in what's known as the house that Madonna built. She toured with Madonna as one of her two backup singers and lead dancers for 20 years, starting at the age 18. Can you imagine the level of that experience? Playing all over the world in 100,000 seat stadiums, and Donna, you know, she auditioned and she got the part, which blew her away. So if, if Madonna's got a top hat and a cane, there's Donna with a top hat and a cane. And she's got those bustier things. There's Donna right next to her. And I don't, some people say she carried Madonna's voice. Madonna has a great voice. She's an innovator and a potent artist. But Donna's voice, for a while I said, that's the greatest voice I've ever heard. Now, now she's just tied. But she was attracted to this chant world, and now the best categorization of Donna's music is spiritual pop music. Mm. She's got all these dance moves, and it's incredible the songs she writes, and her voice is just unparalleled, and she knows how to work a crowd. She's played in front of, you know, I don't know how many millions of people in her career, yeah. but she made a choice to start over with her music. That's a great so choice. I admire that besides, yeah, yeah besides I, I deeply love her. She's coming December 2nd. This will be like her seventh December visit in a row. And we call it Donna's uh, extravaganza because mm -hmm. we clear half the room for dancing and let the people who want to sit on the other side. So the dancers don't block the sitters, and the sitters aren't in the way of the dancers. So that's another fun thing, creating concerts the way they should be. Mm. And Tony Danza isn't there. That's why I thought it would. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I have to be careful about that. You might have ruined the whole thing for me now. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd, are you also a musician? Are, do, you, do you play music? Um, I, uh, my instrument is my ears. I'm an amazing listener, uh, and I have great recall. And I've also somehow was born with the ability to write about music. So when I used to do catalogs for Backroads Music, which was a 28-year run, I would write a review of every album. And they were not, let's see, the instrumentation is this, and the tempo is this, and the history of the artist is this. People would say, I don't know what it is, but I read your reviews and I get a feeling of what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And then people say, well, every review you write says it's the best thing ever. And I go, well, for what it is, it is the best thing ever. You know, this is the best Tibetan Bells CD you can have. If you don't like Tibetan Bells, that won't help you. But if that's of interest, this is the one. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate to be a first draft writer. If I was in the mood, I could write like 20 reviews. And I still write reviews. I'm the music editor for Common Ground Magazine in the Bay Area, which is a wonderful monthly publication. So I get to write about music, which I, I love to do. It's very, very important. Well, music so. needs music needs supporters, needs people like you. And I remember for years and years doing music, uh, feeling no support at all. And then I, I moved from Los Angeles to Portland, Oregon, where everybody is a musician, mm -hmm. even if they just picked up a guitar three months ago, they're out trying to get gigs. And it was kind of like not a supportive environment. So, you know, it's tough because musicians on their own, they're not necessarily great promoters. They're not great at getting their own 
are yeah. out there. They need somebody out there who's a great listener who can say, hey, check this out. This is a great artist. That's right. You know? And not have ulterior motives yeah. behind it. Right. It was very hard back. Well, I, I was a musician through the 90s and into the, uh, I would say to the, well, I guess what year, 2011 or I think I played my last live show in 2012. And it was a tough time to be a musician, especially a rock musician. There just wasn't any support. And everybody was just it's dog eat dog, everyone out for themselves. And as a result, you're playing to five people at best. You know, it was not, it wasn't really the kind of environment that a musician can thrive in. So, I mean, I'm a little jaded in that regard, but yeah, you know, I, I've moved on from there at it, this time. I'm not a musician that, in that hard, way anymore. It's hard not to be. It's really difficult. Musicians are not valued. You know, you go to a concert and a lot of people have the perception, well, they just get to come out on the stage and play their music and, you know, they get lots of money and then they're done. I have no idea what it takes, you know, and being mm. on the inside of it from any angles. Um, I started as the ultimate record buyer. You know, I bought records every day. And then I started a record store, a hippie record store that grew like crazy because I knew exactly what a record buyer needed to be happy. And then I started, this is such a great progression. Then I started a distribution company that sold to stores because I knew exactly what record stores needed. So I provided all of that for no extra charge. So, and then I started a record label, even though I took a blood oath never to do it. <laughs> um, and it became very successful because I knew exactly what distributors needed from a record label. So it was really interesting progression. I never did manufacturing because I wasn't interested and I had no idea what they needed. So I skipped that part. But I'm realizing as I say this, that the opportunity to produce independent concerts was to completely expand and make up what a concert experience could be so like we we welcome everybody that comes we have a pre-concert reception with tea and cookies for an hour beforehand because a normal concert experience for many people in the crowded bay area is you drive through traffic i mean la is even worse but you have to drive through traffic frantically you have to get there and hope you can park, which in San Francisco, I promise you, you can't. <laughs> and you hurry to your seat in the dark, usually or often not on time, and you sit in the dark for like 85 minutes and you go home lonely. So what, what I'm trying to do and succeeding so far is the opposite of that. If it's not about connection and it's not a community event, then I'm not that interested. Mm. I'm not here to be Bill Graham. Yeah, I really appreciate that, the way you're doing that, because so many of my music listening experiences are in dingy, disgusting bars. You know, it's <laughs> dark, it's it's filthy, there's something yeah. wet on the ground, you're stepping in, you stepped in gum, you know, and and it's it's a cold environment. And it's not about music. And for some reason, rock musicians think that's really cool. Yeah, for everything I don't know to why. smell like beer and stale it's, cigarettes. It's disgusting. <laughs> and it's oh, yeah. funny because that's my... that's all your life. yeah. <laughs> and as a musician, I hated that experience. I actually started opting for playing in coffee houses where it was a little more yeah. comfortable for the listener because our music wasn't hard rock. It was it was thoughtful and, again, conscious music. And we was, we got sick of the whole bar scene. And we started playing in coffee places and, and art galleries. But you can still step in gum at a coffee house. Well, not in the you art can, galleries. And people often aren't, <laughs> often people aren't listening very well. No, that's true. You know? having conversations well that is the end of hour one lloyd thank you we're going to come back and talk more about music and other things please stay tuned you're listening to the human frequency on american freedom radio Welcome back to The Human Frequency on American Freedom Radio. We're here with our special guest, Lloyd Bardi. I pronounce his name wrong. I pronounce it Bard because he's into music. Shame on you. <laughs> well, Lloyd Bardi is the producer of our event up in the Bay Area, which we're getting ready for and very excited about. 
We're going to be up there on October 1st at the TMS Performing Arts Center in San Rafael. And you can meet us and you can meet Lloyd. And we're going to have a great time talking about solutions to many of our problems with air pollution and dangerous energies and drought. We're going to solve all those problems on October 1st in San Rafael. Uh, and you can get all the information for that at thecambo.com. That's T-H-E-C-H-E-M-B-O-W.com. And Lloyd, what is your website? So everyone can check that out too. Yeah. Um, well, there's two ways to get to it uh, because there's been a shift in some sort of presence. But the easiest one to remember is www.dancemarin, D-A-N-C-E, M-A-R-I-N dot com. On there is all the events, and they're all linked easily to the uh, event page or the ticket page, and you can contact me there. And there's even a link to get to this 32-page list of compact discs. Remember those things? They're very compact. Um, that you can actually explore and purchase music for great prices. New, used, rare, and definitely hard to find. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. That's an easy one, and you can also get there by doing www.LloydBartyProductions.com. So either one, but Dance Marin, it's a little catchier, I have to say. Mm. It's easy to remember. One of the things that you do is you're a dance facilitator, and uh, I was wondering, what does a dance facilitator do? Well, it's more that I'm a DJ. Dance facilitators, they will have a little headset or a cordless mic, and they'll suggest to people, you know, breathe, expand, try and get into your feet because it's as far away from your head as you can get, and those kind of things. A lot that was pioneered by the great Gabrielle Roth, who started the whole Five Rhythms and Sweat Your Prayers um, explosion that's now all over the country in various forms of ecstatic dance and ways where people can come together and dance however they want. And they're very respectful. It's also called conscious dance. Um, hopefully the music's great. It usually is. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. Whenever I go, which is often Sunday mornings, as regularly as I can, I just go, how great is this? I can go dance and move for two hours. I can sit in the corner. I can interact. There's actually requested no talking, so it's not like a you know a pickup scene. Although there's a fair amount of picking up, picking up on there, but nevertheless, you can sit in the corner, you can dance by yourself, you can close your eyes if you're careful, and they fill the room. 150 mm -hmm. people come, and often if you don't get there within you know 10 minutes of when it starts, they say, "I'm sorry, we're full today." What a cool thing! So you have to be sold that's out. a lot of it. And I, <laughs> yeah, and, and they have they have two two hour sessions every Sunday morning. Well, you know, the picking so up people, people are... is okay. I mean, it's better than having to do it online. You know, at least <laughs> people are meeting in person once again. And I mean, Gabe and I met online. Yeah, it's it's not a very exciting meeting story, is it? it it's <laughs> not. But a, a, a more interesting story is the fact that when we are doing this event on the first, that is Sharon and my fifth anniversary. Yes, it is our fifth anniversary. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Wow. I'm having my fifth anniversary in November. Your fifth anniversary like in that. November? Yeah. Well, congratulations. So that's cool. Cool. I'll, I'll share this story because it's the best story I know of in this kind of department. Um, Deborah, my beautiful partner, wife, best friend, and all those things, she and I met in Greeley, Colorado, about four years into my little record stores. I was 26 and she was 24. And we met in the midst of a Sufi belly dancing community. And you asked me if I played a musical instrument. And the instrument I play with some proficiency is like a Middle Eastern doombeck drum, which are those hourglass drums that people play for belly dancers. And we went all over the country. We went to these Sufi camps, dancing, fasting, meditating, mostly dancing and drumming until you couldn't do it anymore. And we'd go for a month to uh, North Carolina and two months to upstate New York. And we did all that great stuff. 
a real tight knit group of like nine people that hung out together and I was dating her best friend. But Deborah and I were really close as friends and then I ran off and joined all those circuses I mentioned and she stayed in Greeley and married someone and was married for 28 years. So we had huh. quite a long time with no contact for no particular reason, just moved on. And then she left the marriage because it was just, she had to do that and she went to Southern California and studied with Deepak Chopra and did a bunch of stuff for a half a dozen years. And among her many talents, she does design work and all kinds of great things. She was the go-to massage girl in our first era. And one day, a client of hers in the Bay Area sent her a website just so she could get colors and design and the idea because she wanted Deborah to design her bedroom in a kind of a casbah style. So she sent Deborah to her Harmonium Teachers website. <laughs> and on that site, and the colors were fantastic, very casbah like. And there was a scrolling testimonial for this guy, Daniel Tucker. And the testimonials were by Jai Utal and Shiva Ray and Krishna Das and Lloyd Barty. There I was. And by the time it came around about the third round, she went, that's got to be my old friend Lloyd. I knew he went to the Bay Area. He was always into music. So she looked me up and saw that I was doing concerts and had a son. And it appeared like I was with this woman. And so, except I hadn't updated my website in like three or four years because I didn't know how and I couldn't afford to pay someone to do it for me. So I just left it there. Anyway, she sent me an innocent email. You may not remember me, which is now the greatest opening line in history. <laughs> and she was on the train from Santa Barbara. One week later, uh, she saw that I was producing her favorite artist named Tina Malia was extraordinary and she thought she'd say hi to her old friend and come to the concert of her favorite artist who was living in her cd player for the last three years so i picked her up at the train station on a route to berkeley that i had taken literally hundreds of times and after i picked her up at the train station i got totally lost and had no idea where i was that was a sign we went to the concert one of the fun things was she was so starstruck to meet Tina, who I had known for half her life already. And so she was like a little girl and she was excited and she met Tina and the concert was extraordinary. And she came home with me and basically never left. Wow. That's a much not, better story than Tina, ours. Deborah. Yeah. <laughs> much more interesting. Isn't that a great story? The it best, is a great story. The best thing about it is it's not a fairy tale. You know, it's so real and we are very fortunate and grateful to be together. And, and then we started teaching classes together. So now we really get to share. And, you know, in an informal way, we were seen as intimacy mentors, which is a business card I'll have to make someday because mm -hmm. that's a good thing to be. So you guys are helping men and women with different gender issues. And I know I hear a lot about gender issues in the mainstream media and in the independent media. But since you guys are actually helping people with different issues, what are the biggest gender issues today? Um, well, the ability to listen and receive, that's not specific to either gender, by the way. And it's, you know, in the broadest kind of, uh, I don't know, in a certain sense, it's being able to allow our masculine and feminine expression to move towards merging, to realize, you know, I'm just about to roll out this work with men that I'm calling how to detox the be a man box so that men don't have a sense of false masculinity and they don't have to be tough and they can have emotions and they can stop dominating and beating and competing and for both genders you know my prayer is to stop using each other mm. so much wow. big, much bigger top you should talk to uh, our fellow host on this network chuck ocelli he had a whole episode about 
men and women using each other. It was, he, he needs some guidance to, he doesn't have to be upset with women because it's not all our fault. <laughs> but he had some good points oh, about no, how women use all. men and how men use women. Yeah. Well, that's unfortunately the core of connection and chemistry. The idea of chemistry when if it doesn't have the potential to end up being with your best friend and you're not feeling it with the other person, you know, then just learn to be with yourself for yeah. a while until you're ready to receive another person. Mm. The course that we teach was originally designed for women. It's called Calling in the One. And it's very large online. This wonderful woman in L.A. named Catherine Woodward Thomas wrote this brilliant book. It's a great workbook, even if you don't take a class. Um, it's, it's anywhere. And it becomes a daily practice. And it's the best relationship book I've ever read by far. So those are the classes that we teach. And after uh, at our wedding, Deborah told her calling in the one story because she took the class with three friends of hers around the country. They just got together with no teacher once a week. And by the end of the class, it's an eight-week course. You set an intention, and Deborah's was to meet her beloved by May 1st, to be married before the end of the year, and to be walking hand in hand on Hanalei Beach the following January. That's pretty courageous. And very specific. Yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> very specific. So she arrived at this Tina Malia concert on April 29th. Huh. We were married. 11 20 2011 at 11 20 in the morning and so there was that part and by coincidence we each had our own already planned retreat in Kauai in january so that first morning that we met on the beach and walked hand in hand at sunrise you can just imagine what that was like so she told this story at the wedding, and right away, a group of women from the community I was involved with went up to her and said, will you teach a class for us? So that was the first calling in the one class she taught, which was awesome. Mm. And then my sister and a bunch of her friends came and said, will you teach a class for us? And that was the second one. And then the guys from the spiritual community said, what, like, don't we count? Can't we have a class? And then I started co-teaching that. And I was reading this one chapter where it said, this is what women need, and this is what's important to them. And I read that, and the next paragraph said, this is what men need and what's important to them. So in my mind, I read those two paragraphs and switched the genders. And I went, okay, there's no difference here. This needs to be a co-ed class because men and women need the same thing. And what are those And a lot things? of my... Well, they want to be received. They want to practice self-care and learn how to do things together. And they want to explore their own healing and their own individuation while still living in some sense of communion. You know, that's what our wedding invitation said. So to it can be mutual. Individuate. Not everyone has it, to use each other. It's always mutual. No, no, no. In fact, not at all is, is, is the best thing. Right. And when we started doing co-ed classes, what was great, you know, we've had more women than men, but some classes have had equal or more men, is that you don't get any inside scoop. It's not like men finally get to understand how women really think, because these are very intimate, confidential classes where you get to be witnessed and you get to witness other people and you start to hear your own true voice. It's amazing. We get to watch this. We, we're going to start our 27th eight-week class in about three weeks. So there's another soft pitch. Come take our calling into one class if you're in the Bay Area. People say, what's your success rate? And we say 100%. Is that on that the Dance Marin site? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it is. Okay. It's also on the Dance Marin site. All, all there's flyers and links, and then you can get more info. But people have created miracles. We've had couples, fully committed couples, singles, all ages and preferences, uh, couples, singles, and those that aren't sure what they are. 
-hmm. Those are the best kind. But it's a miracle to watch how people's appearance change, how we'll ask a simple question, maybe about childhood or about this experience, and they'll go, wow, that's a really good question. I've never thought about that. And we get to see people relax out of the fear and obligation and guilt and start to hear their own voice. Mm. And until you can be with yourself, the chances of really being with another person and watching the chemistry turn to, you know, like when the Bunsen burners explode and you're in the, you're t you're in the college of the chemistry and drama department, that's not what relationships are about. So it's a miracle for us. We love doing it. It keeps us clean and clear because we love co-teaching. We don't bicker. We don't step on each other's toes or finish each other's sentences. And we get to really witness each other. So it's we love doing it. Oh, it's The great. balance of, oh, and music, since that's our primary topic, every class begins with a song which I select, and Deborah's as good at it as I am now. And we play a song at the break, and we have a closing song. And we usually play background music, very soft and opening, mm -hmm. during the whole class, unless one of the people that's coming says, I can't think of here with music on. So we say, okay, we turn it off. It's not essential. But generally, it creates such a beautiful space. So Where do that's you a really exciting thing. So that's our great story. It's a great story, yeah. and the work you guys are doing is very interesting, too. I think a lot of people would benefit from from learning that they don't have to fit into a box based on being a male or a female, but it, this isn't about yes. this isn't about blurring the lines either. This is about being secure in who you are, and that, that interests exactly. me very much. Very well said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and part of it, you know, the, the first week is starting to, like, what's your vision and to start to begin there, and Every class is different, but it's the same workbook, and it's daily. There's seven chapters and seven lessons. So by design, you do one every day, which gives you a daily practice, a time to be with yourself and look at the things that you've either been afraid of or avoided or just went, I don't have time for that crap, but whatever it is. And so there's a, the second and third weeks are a very deep dive into what's called toxic ties and reclaiming an identity where, you know, everything you heard up until when you were like four or five years old, you believed it and you start to realize, well, they didn't know any more than you did. And sure they did the best they can, but regardless, mm -hmm. it's time to stop piling on ourselves. It's time to look around and say, what's important? It's okay to ask, what do I need? without your partner saying, oh, you're so needy. You know, one of the first things I told Deborah when she arrived here and we started to create our life together, she's very sensitive. She'd been in a difficult marriage. She cried almost every day just because she was safe Aww. and she could let the healing begin. And I said, I just want you to know that there's no such thing as being too sensitive. Boy, that really did it. But That's I so believe nice. that. Yeah. And, yeah. And in class, you know, I I am who I am. So I say that and the women are all going, God, is there anyone else like you? I go, yeah, tons of men. They're clumsy and awkward. They don't know what to do. They think they're supposed to have game and be a player. And that's the last thing you need mm -hmm. to create what you want. And so I also say, you know, people say, I'm dating how do I know what the other person has in mind with me? I go, ask them. <laughs> well, that doesn't really Say, work do a lot of the time. People, people play games, you know, with the dating. I mean, when so, I... <laughs> like, like a Seinfeld episode. Right. Well, when I met Gabe online, <laughs> exactly. I was getting emails and instant messages from other guys on this online dating site. And it was all games. Gabe was the only one who wasn't yeah. playing games. And... Uh, even I just couldn't even believe that for a while. But even then, though Gabe and game are only one letter off. But it was a <laughs> lot of games. And I said it at one point, I said, that's it. If anybody screws up and I can catch them in their lie, they're, I'm not going to text them back. <laughs> so I stopped playing games. I said, no more games. And that's when we met. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, it's beautiful. I love it. it's the same time period for each of us. Interesting. Yeah, end of yeah. 2011 was a yeah. very, very stayed... dark, dark time. But Actually, it was a weird time on Earth. Wouldn't you say the, the end of 2011 was a little bizarre? I know. It was the best time I ever had. We well, had we were having a great time, too. <laughs> yeah. But the world was in a, kind well, of a state. Around us. <laughs> was in shambles. No, it, was, it, was, it was the beginning of an emergence that hopefully is continuing and expanding. That's well, we've seen really ample important. evidence that it is, and that is exactly what we hope to facilitate in the northern half of the state by coming up there. And uh, I wanted yeah. to bring up that, you know, we obviously we started talking about music and pretty much kept it in, in that little sector. But I my recollection is the first thing we really talked about that sort of led to where we are now is the smart meters. And that really got right. us talking beyond just the simple musical lingo. So my question to you is, in Northern California, is there an increasing awareness of not specifically smart meters, but just health issues in general that people hadn't talked about much until fairly recently? There is a strong increase in where we live. You know, the Bay Area is pretty fast paced and trafficy and upwardly mobile. And San Francisco is being retaken over by the whole Silicon Valley thing in a, in a general sort of way, where the typical San Francisco culture of young people being independent, they can't afford to live there. Yeah, That's not the answer to your question, but this is, Marin is a very conscious community, including the parents who are determined to get their kids to Harvard or Stanford and whatever. And, you know, you might question values, but they have a level of caring that makes it a joy and a pleasure to live here. And so, you know, the EMF thing and all this stuff, chemtrails, it's a common topic. Well, you that's know, good to know. Sure since... People that don't know what they are yeah. and are nervous about them or those that go, oh, you know, it's just wispy clouds. But whatever it is, that's why I'm so grateful that we made this connection and we can you know, in our own community, present this on Saturday. I'm super excited because I'm going to learn a lot. Oh, thank and to you. to open my mind and understand what it is about. I'm so um, happy just about... Just this week. I'm yeah. so happy to bring the knowledge just, because I'm glad yeah. that people want to know. And I wasn't sure if people up north were talking about it so much. And now that I know, if you just even have a, a, an inkling about something weird going on in the sky, you're going to want to know what it is. And what you can do to protect yourself and clean it up. And then it's just a question of yeah. how deep down that rabbit hole yeah. are you willing to I'm go. I'm not going to go that deep. Uh, <laughs> at this talk, I'm going to go deep enough. Believe me, it goes really deep. Yeah. But I'm going to make sure We're going to keep it very basic. I want to give a good explanation for, for anyone who's new to the topic. I want everyone to be included. So it's I have two hours. So that's ample time to yep. make sure everything's covered. And what were you about to say, Lloyd? Well, a couple of things. The similarity in the work is that people feel disempowered and helpless, whether it's in the dating world or in the self-care world or in the being a planetary citizen world. It's scary without knowing how. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in a certain way in our classes, we, we escort people to begin to be okay about being with themselves and loving themselves. And there's no cliche in that. You know, powerful people come to these classes and they are, they're looking through the wrong end of the telescope. And after a few weeks, they turn that telescope around and everything looks bigger. And the disbelief systems, which are like, well, I really want this to happen, but I know it's not gonna happen to me. That shifts all the way around and people's perspective changes. So, uh, I don't know, maybe it was a month ago, PG&E came and they put up street signs, no parking in front of our house, and they started digging things up and painting little trails to the sides of people's houses. So Deborah went out and asked PG&E, what are you doing? And he said, well, for different reasons and pathways, we're going to move your you know, PG&E box to the other side of the house. And they were doing that for a lot of the houses. And that's okay. I don't care. But she said, 
can you leave the smart meter off? Because I don't want you to move it. And then just put another smart meter on. And she was told, well, it's not our thing. We, we have nothing to do with that, but you can call the office. So my disbelief system said, well, that's going to be a waste of time. But what happened was, because we all get fooled by the good in the world, she got a woman on the phone who was so sympathetic and wrote down, sitting around my desk, a case number. And they were going to do it the next day. And Deborah said, until we resolve this, and the woman agreed, nothing's going to happen until this is discussed. And Deborah said, do other people have this same feeling? And she said, well, actually, yes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this has been a week or two. They haven't come and moved it. And from yeah. that simple act of civil disobedience, we don't think they're going to. And if they come, and we're home all the time, we live, eat, work, play, and hang out here. So we're going to say, no, you can't do this. Here's the case number. And right. not only that, they want to charge us to take it off. And I know this is not new information for you, yeah. but you don't want it in the first place. And right. then they make you pay $300 to get rid of it. That's steep. Whoa. That's a lot more than around here. Yeah, here it's 75. It's, yeah. Maybe you know, it's only 200. Whatever you, it was. It's too if, much. If it was $50, <laughs> it's too much. I know. They shouldn't make you pay. If it's 50 cents, it's too much. It's, it's the principle yeah. of it. Yeah, but you do have rights, and that's important to know, is that they cannot force it on you. And it is my belief that sometime in the future, all that money will come back to everyone who paid it, because I'm sure there will be a class action lawsuit at some point. Perhaps several. That yep. will require these utility companies to give back those extra fees for not wanting the death meter on their house. <laughs> Which is what it is. It, it's so bad for you. Yeah. And if someone just says, no, you can come out here and read it, read the analog meter oh god forbid you should have to employ someone yeah you know exactly it's not the workers fault this is from the top this is from the top down yeah they're just following their orders yeah. but uh, we we appreciate very strongly what you are doing in the field of empowering people and getting them out of the feelings of helplessness and despair and believe me in in our field of work it's the same thing there there are people talking mm -hmm. about chemtrails that do not offer solutions and a lot of that is intentional because that sort of stuff is made to keep people in that state of yeah it's happening and there's nothing you can do it's mm -hmm. like that's just another level of of the deception mm -hmm. and we again we we feel very strongly about bringing solutions into the mix and we're glad to see you doing the same yeah. thing yeah, I like seeing the similarities, and that's why I'm so pleased that I have a forum to present musical artists at the absolute top of creative artistry and friends who come with great knowledge and solutions. You know, we've had another guy that did a series of lectures on the galactic light force, and I mean, that's pretty far out stuff That sounds for me. really good. Yeah, I'm but all he's over getting it. The that sounds right up our alley. I know, I'm yeah. all over that. Exactly. And, you know, so we're doing different things and we're doing very high level uh, relationship classes that we're not teaching, but, you know, we create the space for it. Because mm -hmm. it's like, great. This is, it's community first and community last. One of the things that's that you... the whole purpose. In your workshops, you, you guys are working on disarmament, I noticed. And in the work that we do, yes. we're studying the work of Wilhelm Reich. And so in studying the orgone energy, we're learning a lot about human problems and environmental problems. And one of the biggest human problems is the armoring of the individual. And according to Reich, when you are armored and unable to feel and unwilling to feel, your own life force energy or orgone is contracted and that leads to illnesses like cancer. So I'm wondering if yes. the disarmament that you guys are doing is similar to what he was talking about, about releasing that armor and, and being able to love and feel. Um, definitely. For me, um, before, during, and after my time with Deborah, for whatever reason, I consider myself a lifelong student of personal disarmament. And by that, I mean... It's not happening in the Middle East. It's happening inside me. And it's a continual choice to either, you know, what was the old saying? Make peace, not war. 
it's that simple and that specific and that absolutely ongoing moment to moment. But you don't sit outside yourself and go, am I going to disarm now? You feel it. And it's a, you know, it's a decision. Do I want to be right or do I want to receive? Do I want to make a point or do I want to be, be willing to shift my perspective? That's what disarmament is. Uh, an old expression is you got to know when to hold them and when to fold them. And mostly you need to fold them. You know, mm-hmm. you need to just say, okay, you know, I love what Deborah says to someone who's trying to make a point with her, including me. She says, you know, I'm pretty sure you're right about that. <laughs> that just diffuses everything. I would recommend it, actually. Well, how do and you... it's, not, it's not like, you know, okay, I'm done. It's like, clear, I'm pretty sure you're right about it. It's mm-hmm. your experience. It's what you're saying. But, but it's not that thing like, well, that's your experience. You know, that's like, God, sorry, I'm actually having an experience. So you have to just disarm. You create a safe space. That's what our class is doing. We're very clear about that. But you have to create that in yourself or you're trying to manage and maneuver and negotiate and manipulate towards your idea of a safe space, which can mean not so much risk, and not going past that edge, that comfort edge, instead of going, well, it's up to me, you know, I'm the one that's here. And if I sell myself short, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to buy it back when it's already mine. Mm-hmm. That's that's a part of it. I just made that up. That was fun. <laughs> well, I, I like Deborah's line. I actually think I'm going to try that on my parents next time I see them. It might, yeah. Uh, oh, that's where it, that's where she started. It, it. might. Oh, it really? might. Yeah. I mean, that that might. Uh, I mean, my parents are not just armored. They they've got Kevlar vests on. Believe right. you me. Yeah. yeah. What do you do for somebody yeah, those who helmets is helmets with the horn? Oh, the helmets with the horn. <laughs> what do you do for somebody who has just never said I love you and has worked for thirty years in the financial field and is totally stressed out all the time and body falling apart? You know, what do you do for somebody who just can't express at all mentioning no one in particular no no one in particular (laughs) but what do you do for somebody who just can't express themselves and can't receive love yeah well there's no formula you just extend yourself you can't impose on another person for all the changes you can make in your life you cannot make a change in another person's life but you can give them a space and support and reflect you know and you can just basically love them and feel connected to them. You don't even have to feel their pain, but that's a good thing is to understand they're coming from a different place and we don't know what their experience is or what their role or their karma is on this earth. And people are here to work different things out. You know, that's what I know. And so taking an interest You know, one of the dating or relationship tips that we give regularly is it doesn't matter how many interests you have in common. It matters that you have a common interest in each other Mm -hmm. to get to know them. You know, things start out perfect. This is it. I know it's the real thing this time. And then the basic differences start to surface or the deal breakers. We ask people in our class, okay, close your eyes. Imagine sitting across the table in a nice romantic cafe from yourself. You're now on a date with yourself. Have a conversation. How long would it be before there's a deal breaker? Would you fall in love with this person? Or would you excuse yourself, go to the bathroom, open the window, jump out, and run (laughs) down the alley as fast as you can? And people are freaked out by even imagining being on a date with themselves. You have to confront yourself. You have to confront your issues. I wonder who'd be leaving the tip. That's my question. Who would be paying for the check? (laughs) Me or me. That's right. (laughs) So here's my very best uh, self-invented relationship tip. It's the simplest thing. We're going to write a book, and it's going to have one page. What we do with each other, not as a tool or a method, But 
often we say to each other very specific words. Is there anything you would like to ask me or tell me? It opens the space. It's wide open. Is there, maybe not, anything? What's not part of anything that you would like to? Meaning, if you want to, ask me or tell me. It's instead of what's wrong or you seem upset or okay, spill it. If someone says to me, <laughs> you seem upset, I'm going to be upset even if I wasn't upset. Yeah, I don't like that either. I also don't and like it, it when people that, tell me to breathe. If someone tells me to breathe, oh, yeah, I'm going to get, it. oh man, I'm, I get livid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, and so this is the, this is the space opener with the unwritten, unspoken promise of, I'm here for you and I'm interested. And mm. it's not because you feel something's off. It can be any time. It's not like 1045 every morning. Is there anything you want to ask me or tell me? I am not a robot. But um, <laughs> it's any time. And boy, it's, it's then the, you take the guesswork out of it. It starts to reduce the having both sides of a conversation in your head that are all imaginary. Well, if I say this, then they're going to say that. And then I'm going to have, it's like, God, you know, another funny thing in the class, besides having a date with yourself, is my encouragement to ask what you want to know. How else are you going to find out? And I say, when I used to date, which I kind of never did, but I'd meet someone, I'd go for a walk and I'd go, oh, this is definitely it. But um, that was just me. But I would say after like the second walk, I go, okay, so what don't you like about me so far? And I say that in class and people go, oh my God, how could you say that? And I go, because I wanted to know. <laughs> and I get it's a little radical. But to me, that was what I wanted to know. If that was a terrible thing and uh -huh. they jumped out the bathroom window and ran down the alley, I just waved. <laughs> Well, it's so, all about openness no. and honesty, then. What you're saying is... It is. It's not... There are no games. What's the point of that, right? Yeah. That's an ego and, trip. Uh, online dating, online dating so typically, even though there's a lot of value in it, because for many people, there's no other way, honestly. But we create these profiles that are our best side, that are either a 10-year-old picture or the wrong age, or oh no, mine were all accurate. <laughs> no, seriously, I, I was very, were. very determined to yeah. give an accurate picture. No, because why else would you? And then you go and you finally meet them, and you're trying to show your best side and hide the worst side. Often, and it's like, well, how's that going to work? Gabe put lots of pictures of himself with cats because he knows that chicks love <laughs> cats. Right. Worked on me. <laughs> Man, I love cats. I'm all about cats. I want to tell you. <laughs> I love cats too. I want my yeah. next cat, but I, I travel too much. Yeah. What, uh, what is inner freedom? What is that? Um, let's see. There's a physical measurement of it. Oftentimes when you're eager and you're persistent and you're obsessed, you have the experience that you're on your toes, leaning into something, you know, you can hardly wait. It's like when I used to date again, I was kind of a maniac. A woman would say to me, I need some space, <laughs> which actually happened pretty often. And I'd go, okay, space, like an hour? <laughs> like a day? How much space do you need? 45 minutes. Like, I don't know, I'm getting to like, <laughs> maybe like uh, seven months. <laughs> so that's where you're on your toes and you're leaning into it. And if you're not careful, you're just going to fall on your face in every respect. Yeah. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? <laughs> yeah, that's it. And the other one is when you're back on your heels and you're protecting and avoiding and defending and afraid of the worst thing happening. The experience of inner freedom is when you're just on your feet, like walking into the martial arts mat not knowing what's going to come at you from any side, but feeling personally prepared. Even if you're going to get taken down, you're going to surrender. So inner freedom is a place of surrender. 
it's where relaxation is the key and curiosity is the cure, which means I wonder what's going to happen. Whatever it is, I know it's never happened before. It's not, oh, no, not that again. I'm so screwed. So curiosity, meeting the unfolding with, I wonder what's going to happen. All I know is I want to be attentive to the unfolding so I don't miss it. And the third part of inner freedom is a cellular understanding that everything is a reason to open your heart and nothing is a reason to close it. And when we get to that in our class, which we usually don't, people will go, well, I tried opening my heart and I got crushed. Well, opening your heart doesn't mean you lay down in the middle of the highway. It means you learn to trust your discernment and you open your heart. There's a car accident, something terrible has happened. That's when you need to relax and open your heart so you know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm and what might need to be done or what doesn't need to be done. So those are kind of three principles that if they can be understood and practiced and continually expanded, then you get to live in your body with other humans. Mm. And that yeah. to me is inner freedom. It's very much in line with the work we do with orgone energy. And I think the hardest part for, for people is the work you have to do because you can't just achieve a state like that just by saying, I want to be free. You actually have to confront some of your issues and, and look inside. Yes. That, that's yeah. the hard part, I think. For a, a lot, lot of, of people just want the quick fix mm -hmm. and they don't want to have to, to even think about anything beyond just something doing it for them once and then they're fine yeah. and they can continue with their life now. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. It's, you know, people live their life as a to-do list and a checklist. So they think personal growth is, okay, check. All right, shoo. I'm glad that's taken care of. But it's never taken care of because in a way, you become clear and in a place of true comfort on the level you're on. And you go to the next level where you're a beginner. And you're going, geez. Definitely. I still have work to do. How it great. When you don't have any more work to do, then it's time to say, okay, see ya. That's when you can leave this realm and That's not, right. not any time sooner. And every week, it seems like another new thing comes up when you're working on an accelerated pace, when you really want to make the change, when you really, That's right. then it accelerates. So I, I thought, wow, you know, a couple of years ago, we were first working with Organite and we were seeing remarkable changes in the atmosphere and it felt like the highest I'd ever been in my life. Going tower busting on bikes and making it rain right then and there in the middle of the drought, it was like a high I'd never felt. But now I've done that and we've done it in many places and then I think, well, there's more. There's always more. And then yes. I, I started to do more inner work. So I'd been doing a lot of outer work on the, the earth trying to help then i realized well in, in order to be effective at mm -hmm. this work i've got to work on some of these issues that are still nagging at me and i started working on those and then when you work on one then another one unfolds and it's just it's it seems never ending i wonder if it does yeah that's end. that's good well there is i mean when you really find that peace and you're fully engaged living your passion and your life not anybody else's then there's a, it feels like unlimited energy and you don't have to keep doing. You know, you can ponder and reflect, allow the ideas to come and pay attention to the surroundings. And I like the idea that to really be free, to really be fully present, you need to let your inside out and you need to let the outside in. So you're not living outside of yourself and gaining and accumulating and using. You're not living inside yourself. Everything's okay in here. I ain't going out there. You know, it, it's got to be this like spiral, this Mobius strip that's like infinity. And then, then it's a completely different experience. And you don't have to walk into a room and look around to see who's there or who's seeing you. And that's the turning point when a relationship 
when you draw the relationship to you that you really have dreamed of is when you can just be yourself and you can just show up and go, I am here. It's something. And it continues. Donna DeLore has this amazing song that she wrote. It's called One Day. And the lyrics are one day when all the walls come down. And part of it is, you know, these patterns of our life, they take our whole life to make. They don't just go away overnight. You know, you get a little bit of awareness and you go, all right, now I'm, I'm the man. But the fact is, you have to stay in that place. And sometimes I, I like to bring in, again, anytime you can make it physical, whether it's dancing or opening or sharing, where you can establish this vertical connection. You know, like as if you took one arm up to the sky and one arm down to the ground and you breathe and you bring in the whole breath and now you've established the vertical. Mm -hmm. I like to believe that it's never more than one breath away or maybe two, meaning you can always come back to center. And from that place, now you can establish the horizontal. You can engage the world or the person or the task or the, all right, I got this idea, I'm going to see it through, then you engage it from that established vertical place. And that's where the creativity and the magic and that receptivity of feeling, you know, grateful and gratified and rewarded. Now it's like it starts to feed everything rather than resistance, which takes all the energy or overly considering things and you know being out of that flow of of life it's that simple and that complex well what do you recommend then for a very introverted person that is very content just being alone or just with one person how is an introverted person going to be able to participate more in a community and open up or is that necessary for everyone to do that well, yeah, it's not necessary. That may be their path. People have been fighting their whole life to be with someone. They realize they're just happier by themselves. And they have a beautiful life, and they stop thinking there's something missing. And from that place, they can become more whole. And then they might find someone because they're finally ready for someone else to come into their life and share it as individuals. That's a big part of it. And to not feel that there's something wrong with them. Or find one of these cool dances if they like to move around and nobody was watching or cares how they dance, even though they might not realize that, and go move or go to a yoga class where you don't talk and you get to develop a practice or go running in the park or, you know, the physical is very important. That's how our bodies deteriorate faster is we forget about them Mm -hmm. or we don't feed them or we don't breathe or we don't take steps with the PG&E guy and go, no, that's not okay. <laughs> you, yeah, it, you have to take care of yourself and you have to do what you have to do and you have the right to do that. You have the right to eat what you want to eat and you have the right to clean water and air and to not have an electromagnetically polluting device on your house. And you have the ability yeah. to remove the chemtrails straight out of the oh, yeah. atmosphere. That's what I'm very excited about sharing up north. Oh, boy. Here in, here in Southern yeah. California, we have got beautiful clean skies now. I mean, it's remarkable. And people say, oh, wow. it's because it's summer and they don't spray as much. you got to see over the last two and a half years the in- amazing difference the before and after, it's it's remarkable and so exciting to bring this to new parts of California and and spread this knowledge. Anyone can have clean air. And anyone can, actually, it's a good time to tell people about our blog, which is accessible on our website, thekembo.com. Our Tumblr blog is there with two years, well, actually three years worth of pictures, one pre-organite yeah. and two years of working with Orgo Energy and seeing the amazing changes in the atmosphere and beyond. And, and here's another amazing change, which is fun to read if you're into reading. You can watch my change in attitude from March of 2013 to the present, and you could see my bummer posts. I was in a bad mood. Oh, these terrible chemtrails. 
and you should see the that transformation. That state of, of helplessness it, was it, just it was very evident. So it's actually a journal of consciousness, and so you can you can watch in real time the weather war in California and the development of consciousness of a human using orgone energy <laughs> and discovering the power she already had and that you already have. And also on our yeah. website is uh, we have a photo gallery where we show some basic formations up there because a lot of people look up there and say, oh, they're doing it to us again. But that's not that entirely the case all the time. Sometimes we have, we're doing it back. Yes. And, and that's, that's fun and to look we at. Make, we make an attempt to point out some certain interesting looking formations and shapes that mean that the humans are fighting back and winning, and it's yeah. it's a wonderful thing yeah. to be doing that, participating. Our Etsy store is is a little anemic these days because we have to have some pieces for this event. Plus, we have to gift. We've yes. may, been reserving our Tower Busters for gifting. Which we're going to be doing on this trip and on the way back. So we will be restocking when we get back from this trip. And our YouTube channel is up and running again. And just a quick little bit here, American Freedom Radio is listener-supported, so please go to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, check out all the shows that are on there, and please donate. And Lloyd, thank you so much for being on. we got just a couple minutes left. Your website, one more time, please. Yes. Um, the easiest one is Dance Marin, one word, D-A-N-C-E-M-A-R-I-N, DanceMarin.com. And on there are pictures and links for our classes, for my uh, now hobby music enterprise. Um, I love having these customers all around the country, most of whom I've never met that I consider close friends and family members. Uh, I've got a guy in Cleveland. All we talk about is the Warriors against the Cavs. And I got Walt <laughs> out there in Tennessee who lives 60 miles from civilization and where he lives, it's hardly civilization. And that's been the joy is the connections of, of everything I do and what I'm still creating. So dance Marin is the key. Um, each of the concerts you can read about. I love corresponding with people by phone or by email. Um, our mutual friend, Andrea, who's helping to promote and spread the word about Saturday's workshop. She said, God, there's two things people go I'm scared of that stuff and second what are they trying to sell and I you know that's that's a state of consciousness that is prevalent and then there's the other state of consciousness which is we have the right we can you know call back the power and create our lives the way we want and how fantastic that we live in an area where we can do that we have every reason and right and ability to do that so that's, that's the thing about me. I did a lot of radio over the years in Boulder and on KPFA, and I'm happy to slide into the radio for this wonderful interview. I'm very uh -huh. grateful, and I appreciate it. We're very happy to have had you for yeah. two hours that just absolutely flew by. And maybe, uh, maybe Lloyd, maybe we'll get to the point where one day we'll be discussing kings versus sharks, and uh, we'll, we'll have to agree to disagree yeah. at that point, I'm sure. That's right. That's where disarmament is really important. <laughs> Ex except on the ice or on the court. Yeah. But, you know, I even have my thoughts about the sports world and how it applies to men and women. And, and there's something in that that still needs to be released, even mm. though it's the way, the way of the West and the rest of the world. So that's Dance Marin, all one word, dancemarin.com. And people can go to this website and we encourage you to come to our event in the Bay Area if you're going to be there on October 1st from 12.30 to 3.30 p.m. at the TMS Center. And our website, one more time, is thekembo.com. You've been listening to The Human Frequency on American Freedom Radio. Please tune in next time. Thank you and good night.